Thank you. <clears throat> we'll go through the announcements and uh, once again, welcome to family hour today. And tomorrow, Tuesday, sorry, not tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a oversight meeting at 7 p.m. You can't just walk in there unless you tell us in advance, okay? You're all welcome to join us, but uh, let us know first. Tuesday, ladies' Bible study at 10.30 a.m. and uh, ladies' coffee hour at 7 p.m. There are still uh, brochures out here, so if you have somebody to invite, please do so, and you can self-invite yourself, all ladies. Wednesday, our prayer and devotion meeting at 7 p.m. Daniel Rojoy will be leading us in the devotion part. And Thursday, men's Bible reading at 9 a.m. and uh, Awana. 6.30 p.m., and uh, Ian is the Ian Burgess speaker. He just uh, finished a week ago. Next Sunday, we expect to see Patrick Long with us for the family hour as well as evening service, and he will be concluding our study in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 to 25. And today we have Shane Johnson with us, and uh, he will be speaking from... Uh, topic of his own choice in the morning, but evening he's bound to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, 7 to 19. And uh, that's all the announcements. And I think uh, there was one email that came forth, Trailblazers Young Adult uh, Conference. I think he has a vested interest in that too, so I'll, uh, to please him, I'll announce that. <laughs> Who? Men and women, age 19 plus. When? Friday, January 6th. 6th to Sunday, January 8th, 2023. There's a cost associated with it. Could be anywhere between $161 to $185 based on what amenities you choose. And it's happening at uh, Gulf Bible Conference grounds. Register for the Trailblazer Conference. There are, you can go to the website and get more information or Shane will be able to tell you more about that. And uh, the next hymn is a favorite of mine, 229. 229. It says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns, our God reigns. There are five stanzas, but we'll uh, sing the three for uh, the sake of time today. 229, our God reigns.
Before we open in a word of prayer, we have a couple of people at the back there, Ruben and Ellen. Ruben is an aerospace uh, engineer. He makes sure that uh, it flies up and uh, lands properly so that the whoever is inside are safe and it again goes up uh, into the air. And true to his profession, he had flown out from uh, uh, Ottawa. You were in a bridal wood, right? And then a couple of years he was uh, in uh, Calgary. And then again, true to his profession, he flew down to Hamilton. And uh, here he is with his family and uh, three kids, two boys and one girl. We are glad to see them. And welcome to West Fifth. And I told them, you know, we are just losing one family with four kids, no and Shelby. And we would be delighted to have uh, them as a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I will be happy to have you here, okay? <laughs> that's, that's for sure. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> and Shane is very popular. He's with us, and uh, he is very familiar to these young men and uh, um, our Julia here, and also hi and uh, all those you know this new family. He knew them too. <laughs> so good to have you here. Very familiar face. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you. Thank you for this time that you allowed us to gather together one more time. We have your living word in front of us. That. It's a two-edged sword as it is written, and it penetrates our hearts. Father, this morning, we pray that the same word that is life-giving will also penetrate our hearts and uh, reside in our hearts and take root and produce fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And we pray for Shane as he opened uh, your living word today. Walk through him. Bless him, fill him with your Holy Spirit, strengthen him, and open our hearts to receive the word. And we pray for all those who are here, particularly we pray for uh, Reuben and uh, Ellen. They have walked into our midst, and we are thankful for the family. We pray in the coming days they will be blessed because of uh, who they are and who we are. We are all redeemed children of God. Pray for their little ones downstairs as well. We pray for uh, the sick ones among us who are going through difficult times, and many of our dear ones today are sick because of the weather. We pray that you'll heal them, and once again allow us to bring, uh, come together to glorify your name. We thank you for all that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The last hymn we have is 381. 381. Goes like this, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands, hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart, illumine me. That's our prayer today as we sit under his precious word. will be brought to us by Shane again. I think we should stand for this one, the third one. Open my eyes that I may see.
Thank you, Dennis. And I hope Don has, will have a closing him. Don? Yeah. Okay. Shane. All right, before we open the Word of God, I just want you to think with me for a moment and see uh, if we can match our thoughts. If you had to choose a defining moment to capture the person of Christ, besides the cross, what would you choose? Historians, when they think of nations or decades, like to find the defining moment of that century or of that decade that kind of gave that nation its spirit or its character. And when they look at biographies, they try to find the defining moment uh, or decision or characteristic that that characterizes or captures a person in their entirety. It's It's not a science, it's an art. It's obviously up to people's interpretation and that's why history books keep being written because everyone has their own interpretation. So now I've given you a little time to think about it. What would you choose as a defining, I'm gonna make it a little more difficult, not just characteristic, you can think of that too, but what's a defining passage that captures the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ? Whisper your answer to your next door neighbor there, and then I'll reveal what I think is the passage I don't hear any whispering. All right, I've had a little longer to think on this than you. Let's see if we're a match. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, now if that's what you were thinking, come up here and I have a little sticker for your chest. (laughs) No, uh, you were probably thinking the defining characteristic of Jesus Christ is love. And you are absolutely right. Perhaps you're thinking it is humility. And you are also right. This passage captures both. If you were thinking this passage, wow. Good for you. This is the one that I thought of as I was thinking uh, what message I could bring you today. Let's read together verses 1 down to 17. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, And that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, apparently making his rounds. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Changing his mind right quick, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he 
who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Well, that's a pretty good question, Jesus asked. Do you know what I have done to you? And I think we all have to say, not entirely, but I'd like to know more and more about what it means and what it meant for him to kneel down and do that. Our outline for today is verse 1, he displayed his love. In this passage, he displayed his love. Verse 2, he symbolized what he came to do. This is verse 2 to 5. Everything that happened there while he was washing their feet, I think, captures his whole incarnation, what he came to accomplish by his first coming. Then we'll look at how he illustrated what spiritual cleansing is. Peter didn't understand the parable of the washing. What did it mean? We're going to unpack the message behind the, the bathing and the foot washing. And lastly, how Jesus modeled how we ought to love one another. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, verse 1. You may have a different translation. Uh, apparently, it's a little tricky to interpret that phrase, he loved them to the end. You might have, he loved them to the uttermost. You might have, he loved them to the full. Or, he loved them all the way. Those are all the ideas. I guess the two words there are to the end and absolutely, and they're, they're tricky to interpret. But the idea is he loved them to the max, or all the way. Even though this was the last night, his last night in the world, in the flesh, he poured out his love, it seems, the greatest, the most. He showed them the extent of his love, how far he would go. Ultimately, the cross was the greatest display of his love. He said that. In uh, chapter 15, verse 13, no greater love has a man than this. I'm going from memory, but I better just check it. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. So he showed them the extent of his love by going to the cross, but he also showed them the extent of his love by going to their feet and providing a service that the others were unwilling to do. I like that hymn, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. And that's why I'm having a hard time up here, and you have a hard time at the first meeting describing the love of Christ. And that's why we need to continue to visit it, because we cannot capture the love of God. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. That last phrase captured my attention because Judas is in the room and Judas too is getting this service from the Lord Jesus. He is washing his betrayer's feet. I don't even know if I can comprehend the greatness of his love and his act of humility to wash his own betrayer's feet. All right, so that's the first point of our story, is that the upper room and, and the chapters that follow, chapter 13 and 14 and 15 16, they're all expressing what we see in verse 1. This is his last night with his disciples. He starts with an illustration, and then he gives the most words we've ever had from his lips. I think it's longer than the um, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. He gives his most intimate speech, it seems, to his disciples that night. And it's all a display of his great love. By the way, John neatly folds in half. The first 12 chapters is his ministry to the world. Jesus presenting himself time and time again to the world 
and to his own nation. You see that wraps up in uh, verse 35 of chapter 12. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. The next time the world, the nation sees Jesus, it will be to arrest him and put him on the cross. In the meantime, he goes behind closed doors with his own people, his 12 disciples, and decides to display, showcase his love in the most intimate and extensive way that we know in all, all the scriptures. All right, let's move on to verse 2 to 5, which is really the heart of this passage. Everything flows from it. The lesson about the spiritual cleansing that follows and the practical urging he gives to his disciples to do as he has done. But this is the heart of that message. I want you to see that verse 2 to verse 5 would be quite a long verse to memorize for Awana. It is about 50 or 60 words. It's a very long sentence depending on how your translation breaks it up, but the King James, the New King James, gives it quite a long intro. Uh, supper being ended, the devil having put already into Judah's heart, Jesus knowing that he was going, come from God, going to God. It's all introduction. It's building up to the moment where he rose from supper, knelt down, or sorry, girded himself with a towel, knelt down, and washed their feet. For those who are into English, like I am, because I'm an English teacher, this is called a periodic sentence. It's when you withhold the information till the end of a sentence. It's used to build suspense, build climax, okay? And this is what I think is happening because John, the author, because the Holy Spirit knows this is a very amazing moment. It is built up as it's delivered to us. Let me just give you an example of a periodic sentence so you can see it for yourself. Here's one from a, a famous poem by um, Alden Nolan, if you know it. I'll tell you the title of it in a moment, but it goes like this. Down from the purple mist of trees on the mountain, lurching through forests of white spruce and cedar, stumbling through tamarack swamps. See, you're still on the edge of your seat. You, you don't know what I'm talking about. That's a periodic sentence. You're waiting for it. You're like, and what? Came the bull moose. This poem is called The Bull Moose, how majestic that creature is. And so it's revealed, right? It's built up. And that's what's going on with the way this sentence is unfolding. The Lord Jesus actually washed his disciples' feet. Can you imagine how John the Baptist would have thought of it. He's dead and gone at this point. But he said in chapter 1, verse 27, I'm not worthy to even unstrap his sandal. Can you imagine how Mary would have thought of it? Just six days before, chapter 12, it says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. See, that's proper. That makes sense. But Jesus washing our feet is a reversal of all you would imagine about his greatness. But God 
is a humble God. And he demonstrated that for us in that upper room that night. He told us he was humble. He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Learn from me. But here he demonstrates it. And it's unforgettable. I'm surprised only John put it in his gospel. Not Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But John's purpose was to show that the word became flesh. And so the very fact that Jesus is God makes this passage jump out to us even more. Can you imagine what the angels thought of this? Gabriel, look at this. Our Lord and Master's washing the disciples' feet. How can he do that? Remember, seraphim, they, they have six wings. With two, they fly. With two, they cover their faces. With two, they cover their feet. I don't know why they cover their feet, but they do. So it must have been also shocking to them and a revelation to them that God would do such a thing. Such a service. Amazing. So I find it a symbolic gesture of his whole coming. The, the fact that he disrobes, takes on a servant's towel, girds himself, and performs the role of a servant is all reminiscent of what we read in Philippians chapter 2 of his great coming. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be considered equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. Here we have him taking on the form of a servant, which he did when he went into the manger which he did when he mounted the cross, it was all to serve us. We had a need to be bathed. We had a need to be washed from our sins, and he performed that for us. And it was humbling, and it was even humiliating. But he did it because the characterizing factor of our Lord Jesus Christ is his love and his humility. And here we see them combined in this passage. The manger, the towel, the cross, they all say the same thing. The Lord Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give himself a ransom for many. He did that as he lived quietly for 30 years. He served. He did that as he taught and healed and performed miracles for three years, he served. And he did that as he mounted the cross and died for us. He served. He met our greatest need, which was our cleansing from our sin. Now, just so we know the historical situation here, you know, it was customary to have your feet washed when you're having a formal gathering for several hours as the Passover would be. Uh, even nowadays, it's nice when people don't have smelly feet in your presence, right? It's just not pleasant. My sons have the curse of smelly feet. And so when they get home from work, put your shoes in the garage is how we deal. I don't wash their feet when they get home. Maybe I should. Anyways, um, how much more in a culture where they didn't bathe too regularly, as far as we know. And they had bare feet, and it was a hot culture, and sweaty, and so on and so forth. And how much more when you're not sitting at a table with your feet tucked underneath, you're kind of laying on couches, reclining. Your, feet, your head might be near somebody's feet. It was important to have that service performed. It helped everybody out. The problem that night was they were kind of in a hidden location. You remember they had to find a spot to do the Passover, and Jesus had this situation where you were supposed to follow this man carrying a jar, and 
he would lead you to this upper room. So it wasn't their home, it was somewhere else. So when they got there, there wasn't a servant or a slave to perform this necessary but menial task, this lowly, humble task. The disciples might have looked at each other and said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> so they just ignored it, like good brethren. And they left the elephant in the room, which probably ruined supper. And that's why, in verse 2, it says, and supper being ended. They went the whole time, and no one did it. Now, your translation might say, during supper. I guess there's a, a little difference there. Either one. Supper had been going on for some time, or it was completely ended, and Jesus finally realizes he's going to provide this service for his disciples. And he's going to use this as a teachable moment that this is how we should be to one another. It really is a defining moment in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it captures who God is. I'll tell you that because this seems like a one-time event that he washed the disciples' feet, we kind of imagine he washed it because he had to, he didn't enjoy it, and he didn't want to, but they weren't, so he filled it in. No, I think, I think this is him. I think he did enjoy serving, and this is who he is. Come to uh, Luke 12 for a moment, and this is where I'm taking my thought from. We'll go back to John 13 in a moment. But remember this passage, verse 35 of Luke 12. It says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. All right, that's what we're supposed to be like. But look what he says in verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. So that's what he says he wants to reward his servants with. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like but we get a glimpse of what it may look like in John chapter 13. This is who our Savior is. He's humbler than we imagine. Apparently, um, being humble wasn't a virtue in the first century. It was seen as a weakness, as something not to be. Strength was admired. Being weak was um, looked down upon. It's the Christian ethic that enshrined it as something we know in our cultures today, that humility, being humble, is a good thing. But it's because Jesus broke the categories and expanded our understanding that being last of all is a good thing. Being servant of all is a good thing. It's admirable and noble. Now, let's not get confused of what humility is. It's not thinking less of yourself. That's unworthiness and feeling inferior. Not thinking your opinion matters. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's as, I like this, uh, what C.S. Lewis said, it's thinking of yourself less. Right? We are addicted to thinking of ourselves. It's our default. It's our go-to. You wake up, you're thinking of yourself. It's natural. But humility is to think of others. As it says in Philippians, not to think on your own things, but the things of Jesus Christ. And it takes effort to think of others. Humility is kind of the um, Cinderella of the virtues. Overlooked undervalued, and often forgotten. 
But you remember Cinderella won in the end. So Jesus Christ demonstrated his humility, demonstrated his love. Let's look at what it means for our spiritual cleansing. Peter couldn't understand why Jesus would wash his feet. Jesus said, what I'm doing you do not understand, but you will know after this. You know, I find that a principle of Christian life. As I age, I've been following Christ for 25 years or so, and I don't understand. I didn't understand 20 years ago, but I, I know more now. And hopefully when I'm 57, I'm 47, I'll understand more. And when I'm 67, more. And then ultimately, when I enter eternity, when you enter eternity, you will understand. Perhaps we'll capture just what it meant for him to do this. For him to enter that manger, unmajestied, unmagnified. He who dwelt in unapproachable light, he whose face shone like the sun, now lightless as far as outward glory goes. In fact, before we move on, let's just think about the clothes that he wore, because they tell a story of his coming. The swaddling clothes, the tunic he wore, apparently that's all he had when he ended his life. The towel he girded himself with, and then, as I believe, naked on the cross. His clothes tell a story. He divested himself of his glory, outward glory. He humbled himself in order to become a servant. He took on the form of a servant. Let's just look at his original clothes before he took them off. Look at Psalm, or just listen to Psalm 93 for a moment. It says, the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Well, he ungirded himself of that strength when he got into that manger and was a weak, as weak as an infant, needy, fragile, although unbreakable. Not only that, Psalm 104 says, O oh Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. And yet, he was clothed with a servant's towel. You might say he was clothed with shame and dishonor. Certainly on the cross, that's what he was clothed with. And he did that because he loved his own to the end. It was okay for him to do that because he would go to any depth, to any length in order to loose us from our sins. Such is the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing. No wonder we sing about his amazing love, the love of God, greater far than any tongue or pen could ever tell. Okay, let's move into that section I was in before I circled back. The idea of spiritual cleansing. The Lord gave us a parable, let's say, a, a, a drama of what he does in the Christian's life. He explained it to Peter. Peter didn't understand, and he says, uh, if I don't wash you, your feet, you'll have no part with me. I think the foot washing had two teachings. One was uh, symbolic, spiritual, and the other was very practical. Very practical, which is going to come at the end. 
But the symbolic and parabolic teaching here is that if he doesn't wash us, wash our feet, we have no part with him, which means no fellowship with him, no partnership, no intimacy. We need to confess our sins. We need to repent as an ongoing process in our lives. When the Lord convicts us, we need to respond to that. If we don't, we have no part with him. It doesn't mean we lose our salvation. It means we might lose our enjoyment of him. You ever notice that? When you ignore your devotion to God, you start to, your strength starts to get sapped. Your vigor, your zest for serving him starts to wane. That's because of this concept. We need to confess and keep short accounts with God and keep renewing and restoring our devotion and walk with him. It's because our feet get dirty walking in this world. It's hard to live a perfect life, obviously. But the Lord understands that. He understands. He's made us clean with our spiritual bath. That is, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. That's what he means in verse 10. Those who are bathed. Maybe they bathe once a week in that culture, maybe less. But their feet need to continually to be washed. And that's uh, reflected, let's just turn briefly to 1 John, where 1 John makes it clear of what a Christian is to do day in and day out of our daily lives. 1 John, near the back of your Bible, verse 5 this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, this is the idea symbolized by the foot washing, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. I don't think that means fellowship with one another as believers. I think it means we have fellowship with one another as God and disciple. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... This is the foot washing. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what Peter didn't understand now, but understood after. If he did, uh, John is the one who wrote that to us. I'm sure Peter understood it as well. And of course, Judas there in verse 11 was not clean because he had not had a bath. He had not trusted the Lord Jesus as his Savior, although he had heard all the same things as the other disciples, although he had seen all the miracles that the disciples had observed, although he had even participated in the ministry, and yet he was not bathed because he did not believe in his heart that Jesus was the Messiah. At the end, Jesus puts his garments back on, and that is what he will do when he comes again. And every eye will see him. He gave us a glimpse of what he will look like again. You remember when he took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, gave them a glimpse of what he truly looked like. His face shined like the sun. His garments were as white as any launderer on earth could whiten them. So we see when he put his garments back on, again, this is what he will do when he comes again. We will see him as he is. It will be amazing. But in the time of his humiliation, he did this for the purpose of redemption, for the purpose of serving us, for the purpose of providing an example. He tells us in John chapter 17, Verse 17, he sanctified himself 
for our sakes, because we needed to see it. We needed a demonstration. He provided that for his people, humbly provided that for his people. Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. So this is the practical part of, of the foot washing uh, episode or the act of foot washing. This is the practical part. He wanted his disciples to do the same. You see, they were going to be the leaders in the world. They were going to set the bar. And if they weren't humble... All the followers wouldn't be humble. And remember, they were having a problem that night. We read in other passages that they were quarreling. They were squabbling about what? Who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Let me just read that to you. Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 23 you can see there from verse 20, they're having the Last Supper, the same uh, night that John 13 is. Verse 23, then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. There was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Oh, it's such a privilege to be considered the greatest, the smartest in the room, the most successful the most good-looking, whatever ridiculous category our decade gives to us, right? Right now, my daughter's in grade six, and it's important not to be embarrassed. So when I'm around her, I can't act cringy, okay? That's important. Um, because she's concerned about what people think of us. I'm not concerned about what her little girl friends think of me, but sometimes I am concerned of what my coworkers think of me and my peers, so we all struggle with that. So verse 25, he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is considered greatest, we'd say, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Usually, in the world's eyes, it's the one who sits at the table and who's getting served by the waiter and the cook and all that. Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet, I am among you as the one who serves. See, he turns it upside down. And so he said that that night, I am among you as one who serves, and then he showed them what it means to serve. He performed the menial task, the task that nobody wanted to do, the task that was not fun, not enjoyable, and could have been a little embarrassing. And that's what I think we are to be ready to embrace. You know, some churches, they think the fulfillment of this passage is to have a foot washing service once every year or every six months, whenever they do it, they all gather and they do it somewhere. They wash one another's feet and they think that's what Jesus meant for us to do because he says he wants us to do it. I don't think that's what that means. I don't think this church thinks that's what this means. I've never seen you do that here. What it means is to be willing to do the menial task at hand, whatever that task might be. I'll give you a few examples that I see at my church. I see someone taking out the garbage faithfully every week. Somebody's doing that. I see somebody driving uh, an elderly man to church every week to and from, getting up earlier, driving the distance, bearing with them as they take the elevator down and walk slowly out to the car, helping them in the car, helping them out of the car. 
That's a menial task. It takes time, it takes commitment, it takes devotion. I see someone visiting, uh, someone who is ill or shut in, who cannot come to church anymore, and who just loves to have visitors or phone calls. I see somebody making those phone calls, making those visits. I see someone cleaning up after everyone leaves time and time again, or locking up when everyone leaves. And it takes time for all those chatters to leave. Somebody's waiting. That's a humble service, just like our Lord Jesus. Here's one. I'll brag about my wife. She was helping somebody with their bed bugs, because my wife is a clean and so she knows how to deal with that. So she helped them with the bed bugs because they were elderly. And then six months later, she helped them with the bed bugs again. That's a menial, lowly act of service. So you think of what categories you can think of. I don't think we have to make them up or imagine them. When they come up, when a need comes up, fulfill them. Remember what it says in Philippians that Timothy was a man like-minded to the Apostle Paul. who, Because everyone else minds their own things, their own interests, but Timothy, the interests of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you find there's something you can do to help people's needs or even interests, that's a little broader than needs, their interests, take that upon yourself and fill that role. Jesus performed a service. Was it a need? It's a courtesy. It made the rest of the night enjoyable. He kind of did the same at the beginning of his ministry when he, he helped that wedding go off really well. He ran out of wine. Ah, the wedding still could have worked, but he provided that service to make it special. i leave you with this last illustration. I thought it was impressive. Robert Chapman, I'm sure many of you know him from uh, the 1800s. As it says in Hebrews, we're to remember those who led from the past and imitate their ways. Here's what Robert Chapman did. No task was too lowly for Mr. Chapman. Visitors were particularly impressed by his habit of cleansing the boots and shoes of his guests. Indeed, it was on this point he met with most resistance. For those who stayed with him were conscious that despite the simplicity of his house, he was a man of good breeding and that when they had heard him minister the word with gracious, and they had heard him minister the word with gracious authority, they were extremely sensitive about allowing him to perform so menial a task for them. But he was not to be resisted. On one occasion, a gentleman having regard, no doubt, to his host's gentle birth and spiritual standing refused at first to let him take away his boots. I insist, was the firm reply. In former days, Robert Chapman said, in former days, it was the practice to wash the saint's feet. Now that this is no longer the custom, I do the nearest thing and clean their shoes. So that's how he found a way to imitate his Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's conclude this message the way Jesus concluded it, with a challenge to overcome the greatest distance that ever faces us sometimes, the distance between knowing and doing. Right? Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So let's imitate our Lord Jesus in his humbly loving service to one another. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time to think about your greatness and your lowliness, how you are both our servant and our shepherd. We thank you for sanctifying yourself to give us an example. We thank you for your humble, lowly heart. And we know you have invited us to follow you, 
to take your yoke upon our shoulders. We ask you to help us do that, to overcome our pride and to willingly and lovingly and happily choose a life of humble service, just like you did. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Four hundred and fifty-eight. We've been speaking about our shepherd. Gentle shepherd. 